The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell. I am the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar hosted by the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Thank you all so much for being here. Today's webinar is Using AI to Predict Adult Mistreatment. Before introducing today's speakers, I will go over some information about the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, as well as a brief disclaimer. So the disclaimer up on your screen reads, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by the WRMA, Inc. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services official policy. And then some brief information about the APS TARC. The mission of the APS TARC is to enhance the effectiveness of state APS programs by supporting federal, state, and local partners' use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. And just a little bit more from me before we dive into the actual topic of today. Um, I'm gonna to provide some information about how to utilize and interact with the software that we're using for today's webinar. Uh, the first point to note is that a PDF of the slides and an additional resource are available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel. And you may download them at any time during the webinar. Please use your computer speakers to access the audio for this webinar and adjust those speakers to your desired volume. If you experience any audio problems due to internet connection speed or hardware issues, we recommend that you exit and then re-enter the webinar. All attendees are automatically muted. Uh, please write in any questions or comments that you have in the questions box that's also located in your webinar panel. We'll be responding to any technology-related questions throughout the, throughout the webinar um, by writing back to you in that questions box. And then content-related questions uh, will be monitored throughout the presentation, and we'll read those aloud for the presenters to address. This webinar is being recorded, and I'll, all, re all registrants will receive an email when the recording uh, becomes available on the APS TARP website. Additionally, all attendees will receive an automatically generated email about 24 hours after the webinar has uh, concluded with a link to a certificate of attendance. We do have a quick poll to get a better idea of who's in today's audience. Andy, would you please launch the poll? Certainly, I will launch that right now. This is just a question to um, for everyone to respond and let us know what category or profession you identify the most with. You can vote on the poll by clicking directly on your screen. We will leave it up for a little bit to give folks a chance to respond. You may need to exit full screen mode if you are in full screen mode um, to respond. Um, but again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. This just gives us an idea of who is with us today. So we'll leave it up for another 10 seconds or so. All right, in just a few more seconds, I'm going to close that poll out and then share the results with everybody. All right, and here's the results. Looks like 55% identify as an adult protective services professional, 21% other social service professional, 3% medical, 4% legal, and then 16% um, are saying other. So thank you so much for responding. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy, and thanks everybody for your participation. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our speakers for today. We have with us Scott Corey, who is the Chief Information Officer with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living. Stephanie Whittier Eliason, Elder Rights Team Lead with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living. Dr. Nicole Fedig, Research Manager and Subject Matter Expert with the APS TARC, and Carl Urban, 
Senior Research Manager with the APS TARC. So thank you to our audience for being here with us today. Thank you so much to our speakers. And now I will hand it off to you, Stephanie. Great, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Whittier Eliason with the Administration for Community Living and I'm really excited to be here today to share with you all um, information from our, um, our newest project, looking at um, how can we predict risk of adult maltreatment using um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So today's agenda is going to um, provide some background on um, our vision at ACL um, for the project, as well as for all of our efforts related to elder justice and elder rights. Um, and you'll learn and see a little bit about predictive analytics um, kind of in practice. And we'll share with you what we found in doing some updated research on risk and protective factors. and and also in looking at the different data sources that um, could be available to us. And then we'll move into the actual modeling findings and implications. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Um, I, was looking, <laughs> I was actually looking at a different set of slides that didn't move. So I apologize for that. I, um, I always like to remind folks of ACL's vision for elder justice, and this really undergirds everything that we do within ACL um, focused on elder rights, elder justice, but we also expand it to adults with disabilities because as you all are aware, um, ACL now encompasses not just uh, programs to support older adults, but also adults with disabilities. And our goal in everything that we do is that older adults and adults with disabilities can exercise their right to live where they choose with whomever they choose and to participate in their communities as fully as they wish to without the threat of neglect, abuse, or financial exploitation. And so I, all the projects that we undertake um, sort of derive from this vision. So next slide. Great. So I'm actually going to invite my um, colleague and our Chief Information Officer, Scott Corey, to um, to take this slide and talk a little bit about our project. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think Stephanie's leading with what ACL's vision for elder justice um, is for us is really important. We know that the information available about adult um, about acute abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults and people with disabilities has some challenges that, that we've been, we ACL and others, some of you have been part of an effort to try and collect national information through our system, the National, Treatment, national Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. We also knew that there's opportunities to learn from others in the, in the social services, child welfare and healthcare, about how they're how they're working with data and how they're working with tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence to discern patterns and to be able to identify um, potentially algorithms that help to predict either the occurrence of certain certain events or um, understand broad trends in how populations are experiencing a particular issue. Um, the goals, the objectives of the PRAM project include identifying uh, risk and protective factors associated with adult maltreatment, um, and also to experiment with the tools um, and develop capabilities so that both ACL and other organizations may be able to use practices like uh, machine learning practices like artificial intelligence, develop an application of algorithms to be able to um, potentially benefit the people that they serve by reducing the risk and prevalence of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Steph, do you want to add anything? No, yeah, I think you covered it. Next slide, please. So uh, taking a minute to describe um, 
why we did this when we did this. Um, we wanted to begin to bring these practices into what ACL does and what others do. Um, we were approached by the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services to partner um, in exploring how these tools might be applied to um, data sets that might allow an understanding of where um, exploitation, abuse, neglect, and exploitation might have an impact on individuals. Um, we wanted to pilot both the use of large data sets as well as tools like machine learning um, and uh, artificial intelligence. This has always been meant to be an experiment. Um, when we started this pro when we started this project, we didn't know what the results would be. Um, and part of what we're what we're happy to to share with you is that we think that the initial results of our work have, are positive and have benefit for all. Nicole, I think you're next. I am. Next slide, please. So before we get into talking about the background methodology and findings of this project, I think it's important that we're really clear on our terms. So predictive analytics is the um, branch uh, that encompasses a number of different advanced analytics that typically uses historical and current data to make predictions about unknown future events. So this can include analytics um, that may be like, such as data mining, statistics, modeling, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, what we're referring to is the ability of a computer or a computer controlled robot to perform tasks that are commonly associated with human beings. So this is tasks related to ability to reason, discover meaning and patterns, as Scott noted, to generalize and learn from past experience. And machine learning is seen as a part of artificial intelligence or AI, which is a discipline concerned with the implementation of computer software that can learn autonomously. Next slide, please. So now we'll get into some of the updated research that Stephanie mentioned about the use of predictive analytics in different fields. Next slide, please. Predictive analytics has been used in the area of child welfare. Some of the common use cases are to assist with decision making, such as um, you know, when caseworkers or supervisors, their time and resources are limited, there are tools that predictive analytics has developed that have been developed using predictive analytics then can help identify the best course of action, whether or not to start or end an investigation or remove a child from their home or some examples. Another use case is to reduce the risk of reoccurrence. And so Predictive analytics has been able to forecast the likelihood, the risk factors associated with the likelihood of repeated events, such as maltreatment reoccurrence or reentry into foster care. A third use case is to estimate elevated risk of maltreatment. So this is to identify those who might be at a high risk of serious injury or fatality. And a fourth use case would be to identify areas where there are high incidents of abuse and neglect. This can help target resources. One of the underlying themes throughout the literature on predictive analytics and child welfare was the importance of transparency, both in the development of the algorithm and as well in the um, implementation of using this for decision making. So it's very important that those who are developing the algorithm are clear and communicating what data inputs are going into their algorithm, as well as in, in the implementation and practice, it helps to ensure a sense of trust um, between the child welfare agency and the members of the public that they are serving. Next slide, please. 
Predictive analytics has also been used in healthcare. Some of the common use cases are to reduce readmission. So practitioners use predictive analytic tools to assist again with decision-making that could help improve and provide evidence base and individualized treatment plans in order to reduce in chronic illnesses. Predictive analytics has also been used to identify rare diseases. Another use case is to improve resource allocation. So the use of predictive analytics has been shown to reduce costs through effective resource allocation. This has been done through an analyzing patterns of healthcare utilization, medication use, and demographic characteristics. And finally, again, sort of this more geospatial use case, using geographic predictive analytics has helped researchers identify areas, populations where um, there are medically underserved communities. So again, one of the underlying themes across the literature is that even though there are some post-implementation issues to consider in terms of bias and other issues that come up with um, algorithm development, the use of predictive analytics has been shown to be successful in improving healthcare quality and reduction of healthcare costs. Next slide, please. A third area where predictive analytics has been used is in criminology. So this has been coined the term sort of predictive policing, which refers to the usage of analytical techniques such as predictive analytics in law enforcement to identify potential criminal activity. So what that might look like is to identify perpetrators to multiple crimes that they've committed, to predict likely victims, to, to improve resource allocation and to assign police to high crime areas. Again, sort of that geospatial and hotspot idea where crime might be likely to happen. So some of the challenges here um, is that, you know, more policing, more predictive um, algorithms may lead to more recorded crime and, um, and you know, introduce a lot more um, needs for the resources to address the crime. And one of the other key considerations in this area and also across all of the fields that we've talked about, are the issue of bias um, and in particular racial bias or racial profiling that might um, need to be considered or handled from an analytical or an interpretation side um, of things. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Carl to talk about how predictive analytics can be used to identify those at risk for adult maltreatment. So if you think about criminology, healthcare, the social work of child protective services, if you think about APS, it has in a way uh, some elements of all of the above. Um, so it's only natural that we think that some of the ideas and some of the some of the benefits of this type of of analysis could be extended to adult protective services. Um, the reality is though, it hasn't ever been done before in APS. Um, uh, and, and there's several reasons for that. Historically, APS has not been a particularly um, data rich environment. Uh, we've all sort of heard the slogan, no data, no dollars. Well, it's also true that if there's no data, there's no data science. Uh, but that's really changed in recent years with the establishment of the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. Uh, and researchers through NAMERS and through CMS are starting to get access to more robust data sets. Uh, and so we've seen a little work um, very recently in this area. Dr. Tony Rosen uh, did some work with um, Medicaid data to kind of ask the question about whether machine learning could work to better understand what is going on in elder abuse and neglect. Um, and Dr. Jason Burdett and some of his data scientist colleagues down at UT Houston uh, used Texas APS data, which is a rather robust, good data set, uh, to do the study that you see outlined here, looking at sociological indicators of senior financial exploitation. Um, we're, we're just sort of starting to scratch the surface in this project is getting us going in terms of thinking about predictive analytics and adult maltreatment. Next slide. 
Um, so then the question is, well, well how, how can we use it? Uh, Nicole talked about all of those use cases in all of those other fields. What's the use case uh, for APS? Um, and so, you know, as I've worked through my management career, a couple of different things I've learned about projects. One is that first, there's often as much value in the process of doing a project as there is in the product. Uh, and the other thing, uh, is that data doesn't always tell you what you need to know, but kind of helps you figure out the right questions. Both those things are very true as they apply to this project. Uh, and so what you see here are a number of ways that predictive analytics can be used to potentially improve APS services. Um, I wouldn't call this a definitive list, but it is a list of promising areas to think about. Um, and so, for example, the models that we've developed that we're going to describe here in just a second can be applied at the county level to identify populations that are at risk. And based on that, you can do some service planning to try to address their needs. Um, and, and knowing where the risk is is going to help us target resources to better address needs. Um, um, when you look at some of the data later in the presentation, you're going to kind of scratch your head and you go, I wonder why that is that way. And the answer is we don't know, but it does help us to figure out what the right questions are to better understand uh, the phenomena of adult maltreatment and the best ways to respond to it. Um, and so we're going to be able to understand risk and the relationship and what impacts the rates of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, and this is going to help ACL and other community-based organizations focus on the factors that we need to focus on for purposes of prevention, either in terms of the recurrence of current APS clients or reaching out into the community to CMS clients or other clients um, that may be at risk and trying to figure out what we can do so that they do not end up as victims of adult maltreatment again. Um, uh, and, you know, ultimately this is about the client. And so the, the, the bottom line outcome that we're looking for here in terms of application is helping us to know the individuals that are most at risk uh, so we can prevent their maltreatment. Next slide. I'm gonna take it from Carl and um, reinforce his statement that sometimes um, as you're doing a project, you learn from the project itself. One of the things that we found to, to be incredibly important on this, on this project and in this journey is to, the, is to have convened a technical expert panel. Um, that panel was meant to guide us um, in having and get access to expertise that we might not otherwise have. Um, this included other federal, uh, other federal agencies, and um, particularly folks who have program knowledge and data knowledge in the federal government. We reached out and identified a set of state and local APS administrators to participate with us on the, the technical experts panel. We included academics, data scientists, and nonprofit organizations all to help us help inform the work that we were going to do and where we ran into potential issues um bias potential bias being one having having folks that we could call on to say are we doing this the right way have we created by using machine learning on um, with a defined data set a particular defined data set a potential for bias so I think I think all of us who've been involved in this project would would recommend considering the use of some panel that's the some group that's the equivalent of our tech expert, technical experts panel to in any kind of effort that you might choose to undertake that's like this. And Nicole, I think you're up next. Yes, thanks, Scott. Next slide, please. So one way that we leveraged um, the TEP, uh, the Technical Expert Panel, was validating a research question. So, you know, the subject matter experts, practitioners, um, state and federal stakeholders all came together and said, 
you know, what is the use case here? What is a question that we can answer um, relatively quickly to start experimenting with machine learning? And ultimately, we arrived at this question, which is, what community or county level characteristics predict adult maltreatment, neglect, and exploitation, or a &E, and lead to APS, Adult Protective Service, system engagement and involvement? So I think it's really important to underscore here that this research question was really a collaborative um, effort, again, validated by our TEP and discussed along the way, you know, as we were going through, is this the right question to be answering and what are the data sources needed to do that? Um, so it really did reflect a deep discussion that was sort of iterative in nature. Next slide, please. So as Stephanie mentioned at the beginning, um, we did an updated literature review on the risk and protective factors associated with adult maltreatment. There was a systematic review done in 2015 by Dong. And so we sought to um, update, to look to see the more recent literature, what we could learn about risk and protective factors, while also considering some of those more foundational papers um, that have, you know, um, shed some light on, on risk and protective factors. And we identified over 50 different risk, risk factors. Um, and then just a couple of notes before we really get into those risk factors about the state of the literature. Um, it was very apparent that the literature uh, is unclear in terms of terminology. So we found, you know, risk factors that were talking, you know, that the, the um, the term was abuse or maltreatment or mistreatment. And so I think one of the first calls to a researchers um, or multiple researchers would be, you know, to make sure that we're clear on our terminology and that might help streamline, you know, the dissemination of this information. Um, we also noted that the studies that we identified focused either on sort of an unspecified maltreatment or they were specific to a specific type of maltreatment or types of maltreatment. So it's really important to consider these risk factors in that way, um, depending on you know, how you're interpreting um, the, the literature. Um, and with regards to that, there was some really clear overlap between the risk factors. For example, low social support, um, some socio and economic, variables were across, you know, maltreatment in general, but also, you know, the specific maltreatment types. Um, but there were also some clear distinctions. So I think financial exploitation and sexual abuse only shared two risk factors, um, but every other risk factor was distinct to those specific maltreatment types. So it's really important to, to be thinking about that along those lines. So what we did is we developed several domains of risk. Next slide, please. We identified these domains as an individual, caregiver, perpetrator, and community context as the domains. So I've highlighted here some of the more frequently cited risk factors associated within these domains. As I mentioned, low income and social isolation seem to be apparent across all of the maltreatment types and the unspecified maltreatment type. Some others that I think are important to note here are depression, poor health, requiring assistance with activities of daily living, marital status, being separated or divorced, again, sort of maybe coming back to that social isolation piece. And then there was some indication that being female would increase increase one's risk, risk, but I would like to just note that those findings were complicated, that, um, and some other studies identified males um, being at risk. Caregivers, um, in terms of the caregiver risk factors, having perceived burden or perceived stress was a risk factor. Um, a caregiver substance abuse or mental illness was also identified as risk factors. Perpetrator level characteristics were dependency, 
potentially meant some kind of mental illness or substance abuse. And then the third area, community context factors. Now, we really tried to focus in on this, right? We're looking at community and county level characteristics that might predict APS system involvement. But despite all of our efforts, there really is not much literature on community context variables that might increase one's risk. The two variables that we did see were abuse culture and living, residing in a rural geography. Next slide, please. We found far fewer protective factors. Um, there were about 15 potential protective factors. Um, we think that the, the, what we did identify should be interpreted with caution though. Most of these studies um, were conducted within specific samples or populations that may not be generalizable um, and they were not tested with control groups. So a lot of times these were, you know, protective factors that the authors sort of had hypothesized um, or saw some evidence of protection but really they were not you know, empirically based or 100% effective um, in the literature. So some of those protective factors include having social support. So again, sort of the inverse of the risk factor of not having as much social support or social isolation. Having a good network of individuals to support someone seemed to be protective. There were a number of caregiver uh, interventions that were also identified as protective, as well as education on um, the incidence of abuse, neglect, and exploitation and possible services that one might uh, seek out. Next slide, please. So what we did is, and you can move on to the next one too, um, we did a, we cross-referenced um, the I, the risk and protective factors that we identified in the literature with data sources that might contain that information. And we created a repository of these data sources that included over 60 um, data sources that might have some information about the risk and protective factors, as well as um, some information about abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And then once we developed this inventory, we prioritized the data sets by um, several criteria. So to answer our research question, we needed to have county level data. So we needed county FIPS codes. We needed the data to be publicly available because we didn't really have the time um, to get any other data sets. We were looking for population wide or surveillance data. We, it wasn't going to behoove us to have you know, a survey data of individuals living in a particular region although there is some value to that and could be explored in the future. Um, and then finally, the data that were collected, because we were using the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System as our target variable, there we wanted to have data collected at the same time period compared to that period of namers. I'll turn it over to Carl. So as Nicole um, just indicated our, our target variable was based on data uh, that we collected from the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. Uh, so NAMERS is um, a relatively new data system that the Administration for Community Living established to collect data from state APS programs. Uh, it's been collecting data since 2016. Um, and it's designed to collect different types of data from different types of states based on what their capability is. And so you see a reference uh, here to collecting data from case component states. When we say case component, what we're talking about is the fact that 33 states are able to provide us with case specific data that is based on each individual investigation that they conduct during the course of fiscal year, so it gives us the the case information that you see here in that last bullet on clients, the maltreatment type, the perpetrators, uh, as well as the disposition of the case. And it gives us a good base level set of information to determine rates of abuse, neglect, exploitation, uh, and some information to help us understand beyond these base, la base level um, data elements. 
Um, one reality in NAMERS, which we will come back to, is that there's a lot of disparity in the data and the number of data elements that states are able to provide. And so that was kind of one of the, the, the issues that we had to work through here was the disparity in the quality of the data um, from the states. Um, one of the benefits of machine learning is it gives you tools to kind of work through stuff like that. Um, but name, you know, the, the good news is that Namers gives us that base level set of data that we can then use to, to uh, do the machine learning and the comparisons and the associations with all of the other community factors. Next slide. So some of the additional data sources to complement the NAMERS data source, we used the American Community Survey, which provided some information about social, economic, housing, and demographic characteristics of the populations um in the specific counties we used the area health resource files which told us a little bit about healthcare infrastructure and the services available in those counties the county health rankings which included some information about health outcomes behaviors and access um, in the environment the consumer complaint databases which told us about um, potential fraud or financial exploitation the IRS 990 data set, which told us about nonprofit service providers in counties, and the USDA Food Environment Atlas, um, which told us about food access. Next slide, please. So now we'll get into the development of the algorithm, um, and we'll start off by talking about, again, that target, what we wanted to predict or estimate. And I'll turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so we really started out with two um, considerations. What considerations we needed to develop algorithms and to apply machine learning and AI. And the second set of considerations were those involved with implementing um, the results of what, what we've developed. Uh, as Carl has alluded and also Nicole, um, Looking at the quality and completeness of data that was available from each of those data sets was really critical. Um, ensuring that we understood what data scientists were recommending and um, making sure that it was consistent with the knowledge of subject matter experts about, um, about abuse, neglect, and exploitation was also critical as a consideration both of the, and then finally, and we've spoken to it, we were always watching for bias um, to potentially creep in, particularly where we were using iterative versions of machine learning. Um, we were always concerned about these three things, accuracy of the results, um, what was involved with the staff who were training the algorithms to look for things um, and then finally to account for the bias that may have been um, may have been a result of what we proposed to do with our machine learning and our algorithm development. Next slide please. Um, one thing to note is that this was very much a team approach. Uh, we work with a number of organizations. WRMA has been a key supporter of Adult Protective Services for many years for ACL. We also work with BCT Partners. Um, they, had, they have a, a history of working with social science data to do machine learning and precision analytics. Um, they have been, they were incredibly helpful in helping us identify bias. We also worked with Microsoft as almost an independent peer reviewer to be able to look at what BCT and their team proposed and determine whether or not there were any issues with it. That also was invaluable in helping us identify potential issues with proposed statistical methodology and any potential bias. And this was really intended not to be a black box. We wanted to avoid the approach that's frequently used where you run hundreds, if not thousands of iterations of machine learning, but you can't really explain why you got the results that you did. 
um, we um, made a conscious decision to sacrifice potential accuracy for being able to explain exactly what happened. Next slide, please. And I think, uh, Steph, isn't this, this, who picks up? Carl, this is you. Um, so the, one of the first things that we had to, to think about was, what exactly are we going to look at? What what's our level of analysis? Um, and and we had to make a basic decision between whether we were going to look at individuals or whether we were going to look at more of a geospatial analysis. Uh, we we are very interested in the question regarding um, applying machine learning to better understand the population that is served. But there were a variety of reasons that, and, and this is you saw this in the research question that Nicole was talking about earlier, that we decided that we should look first at geographic areas in terms of a geospatial analysis. Once we decided that, then we had to decide, okay, how are we going to actually look at it? What, it, how granular are we going to try to get? Um, and we we had to settle on the county. Um, um, the, we don't have census track data available in namers uh, namers at that case level that i was talking about earlier only identifies um, the location of the abuse neglect exploitation at the county level um, there is lots of good uh, data from those other data sets at the county level so that was our obvious um, choice for that uh, the state level was probably not granular enough and so we ended up settling on the county level next slide um, and so then the next thing is, what what variable are we going to look at to predict? Um, and, and we had recently done some evaluation work in in APS, and we had looked at at some different what we call process outcomes in APS, where we looked at rates of reporting to APS, rates of reporting of, of accepting uh investigations in APS uh substantiation rates how many what percent of clients ended up getting services and so here is is an example of some of what we looked at you see in that chart the the investigations per 1000 APS eligible people per state and uh you can see there that there is quite a lot of variability across the, the states and so um it became pretty clear to us early on we really didn't want to look at the variable of um, the number of people per state that were investigated um, we needed to look at something that was um, a little bit uh, told us a little bit more that was a little bit that we had more accurate data and were better able to measure uh, and so what did we end up doing Nicole So the project team then decided to train their machine learning algorithms to build predictive models of the growth rate of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So this was done through sort of iterative collaboration and engagement um, throughout the modeling process to first calculate the per capita abuse, neglect, and exploitation per year from 2016, 17, and 18, because that's what we have for namers, and then to calculate the annual average growth rate in those years. Next slide, please. So here you can see um, the rate in 2016 um, explained by those community contexts or baseline risk and APS system factors as predictors to predict whether or not um, the annual average growth rate increased or decreased as time went by. Next slide, please. And next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So what did we find? Um, so the data scientists use a regression-based machine learning approach um, to answer this research question. And they ended up developing um, an algorithm for four different outcomes or target variables. So the first being all types of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. 
the second being self-neglect only, the third, individuals, adults with disabilities, and the fourth being um, older adults as um, a particular state would categorize them um, in terms of their eligibility to come to the attention of APS. Um, so what you're seeing here are the percentages um, that are the adjusted R squared values. So the 46% in model one is the proportion of, so an adjusted R square is a statistical measure that represents the proportion of variance for a dependent variable like abuse, neglect, and exploitation that can be explained by independent variables. So that would include information um, at the county level across the data sets that we talked about earlier. So for this first model, you'll see that 46% of the variance could be explained by those input variables. For the self-neglect model, you'll see that 49% was predicted, um, was explained by our um, predictor variables. For the third model, individuals with disabilities, 64, which is um, pretty darn accurate. Um, and I want to note too that the sort of the 36%, the not explained, we would expect to see that across any of the models that we would be exploring. You're never going to have a model um, predict 100% of the variance of that dependent variable. Um, and then the fourth model refers to individuals, older individuals, um, for which 22% of the variance was explained. Next slide, please. So for this first uh, model, um, I want to highlight, you know, so the, the piece of the pie that's multicolored is that 46% um, that was explained earlier, and it's broken down to the specific variables or scales that went into the model. Um, the namers, 6.2% there, that is a county level risk of substantiation that was derived using the namers data. So this has information about sort of the depth of the investigation, the maltreatment severity, and client characteristics and other contextual factors associated with the APS investigation. So you'll note here that employment, um, housing, and the namers variable um, seem to hold the most weight in terms of predicting all types of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. You'll also note um, in this pie chart and in others that there's a relatively large percent of other. Um, we can share some of the breakdown of what is in these other character, uh, I'm sorry, in this category of other, um, if you're interested to, to learn more. But I'll go ahead and um, give it to Carl for the next model. So the next model is self-neglect. Um, um, among APS programs, uh, the maltreatment type of self-neglect is by far the most common. Uh, so this one is really important to think about. And then when you're looking at those explanatory factors, uh, I quite intuitively access to services at almost 18% is by far um, the, the largest variable that we looked at. Um, and you can see the percentages for the other ones. And so, Nicole. Next slide, please. The third model was to look at, we thought, you know, maltreatment experiences are very different depending on who you are, um, potentially. And that was, you know, suggested in the literature review as well, um, that an adult with a disability might have a very different experience or might carry different risks. Um, associated with you know, their likelihood of experiencing abuse, neglect, and exploitation compared to um, older individuals. And so we decided to just take a look at these subgroups um, separately. So with regards to adults with disabilities, you can see that access to services, housing, and then their baseline risk um, scores tend to hold the most weight. And again, you know, other is a big chunk of that um, as well, which was primarily comprised of healthcare quality, social isolation, employment, and some other things. Next slide. So the last group we looked at was older adults only. Um, and there are some APS programs whose eligibility criteria is if you're over age 60 or over age 65, 
um, then you qualify for APS. Unfortunately for this one, uh, and older adults are a large percentage of the APS population, the explanatory level was not nearly as high. Uh, and the question is why? And the answer is, I don't know why. I don't think we know why. Uh, it's clear that the community-based factors that we were looking at did not hold as much explanatory power here. And so maybe that's a question for you guys you could put in the chat. If you have any, any sense of where we could get good community-based risk factor data uh, for older adults, for adult maltreatment, we would be interested in knowing that. I think this is an area we're interested in exploring going forward because this is such an important population that APS serves. Next slide. Okay, this is Stephanie again. I think it's back to me on some key findings. So we just wanted to, um, in this slide, kind of roll up what we told you in those pie charts. Um, and so for each of the four kind of groups that we looked at, You'll see a bi-directional arrow, which is saying that for all types of abuse, neglect, and exploitation, there definitely appears to be a influence related to employment, housing, and health. Uh, for self-neglect, accessible community services, as you saw in that pie chart, adults with disability, the two that weigh the most um, is housing and income. And for older adults, mental health and social isolation. What is important to note, however, is that our initial model couldn't tell us or it wasn't designed to tell us which direction was the influence. Now, intuitively, we might say, oh, well, you know, higher social isolation or mental health issues would lead, you know, would be the direction of the impact. Um, but again, we, our modeling didn't show that. So this is actually sort of um, feeding into sort of next steps. So we've honed in on factors using machine learning and um, artificial intelligence so that now we can go and explore these further to understand what exactly is that relationship between accessible community services and self-neglect. And then that would then feed into how might we then mitigate this abuse, neglect, exploitation? Next slide. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure who's taking the next I, th view. I think because, because we're really short on time, um, I think we want to actually um, have Karen read the questions that we've received Did in I the chat. Talk? Or Andy, Karen or Andy. Uh, yep, <laughs> sounds good, I got it. Uh, thank you all so much for that information and for presenting with us today. We do have a few questions in the queue. Um, so there's a question that came in when you were speaking about predictive uh, predictive policing earlier. And then there's another question that's kind of related. Um, so I'm gonna read them both. The first question is, Shouldn't bias need to be addressed from development of these programs, not just as a post-implementation issue? And then the second question is, how can you ensure that bias is eliminated? I can try to take that on and then anyone who wants to add to it. Um, so yes, bias does need to be accounted for. Um, and I think I mentioned that, that there are, you know, bias needs to be considered both from an analytical perspective as well as throughout the iterative. You know, this is a very iterative process. I, the findings from the models that we shared today were not the initial findings that we received. Um, you know, it, it was ongoing. Um, and so, and, and continues to be, we, we hope to continue to work through some of this to address some of the questions Stephanie raised um, in terms of directionality. But, Back to the question, um, bias does need to be taken into account at the beginning, at the onset, throughout the modeling process, and you know should always be questioned, you know, at you know with the interpretation of the findings. Um, 
I think it's very challenging to ensure that there is never any bias, um, which is why I think is something that we need to continue discussing so that we can sort of land appropriately. Thank you so much. The next question is related to the research question that you presented earlier on, Nicole. Um, the question is, what is the distinction between engagement and involvement in the research question? So for the purposes of the findings that we shared with you all today, um, they are to some degree synonymous. What we were thinking might be a, another avenue to look at. Um, so engagement would be just coming to the attention of APS. And so the NAMERS data includes those who receive an investigation by APS. Um, so all of those can be considered, all of those clients may be considered as being engaged. Um, in terms of involvement, there was some discussion um, you know, during the last year about would we want to better understand um, you know, what patterns um, of risk factors might be associated with one's reoccurrence. Um, and ultimately, we decided that that was sort of outside of the scope. Um, that there's a, a number of complexities associated with that. Reoccurrence can be, you know, sort of, uh, it can be a bad thing if it's a repeated maltreatment, but if the individual's getting the services and supports that they need, you know, it's not necessarily always a bad thing. And so um, involvement was, we talked about um, as being, you know, sort of could be reoccurrence. It could be, you know, more complex cases, could be those, that um, were substantiated and not just, you know, come to the attention of APS. And we just didn't have enough time to sort of delve into those. But lots of future directions. Good question. Great, thank you so much. Uh, in consideration of time, I'm gonna read one or two more questions depending. Uh, the next question is, do you envision that states who would use predictive modeling would no longer have a need for risk assessments that may already be a part of practice. Um, I'll take this. This is Stephanie. Carl can jump in as well. Um, absolutely, that is not at all what we would expect or anticipate. Um, this is looking at um, <clears throat> uh, setting up some, uh, one, our ability to look at a community and identify hot spots that we might want to uh, look at more to understand what's going on in a community. So it in no way would, at that level, um, reflect on an individual's experience of, of abuse and sexual exploitation. And then secondarily, as we drill down at the individual level, it, it rather than uh, replacing the need to do a risk or a safety assessment, it would actually, in our thinking, trigger more of them because the idea is that we would now be able to see what characteristics of people who have experienced abuse to gut exploitation are shared and might be in a general population. So I might come to APS and I, you know, and today's assessment may say no risk, but hopefully with this predictive analytics, we can catch some of those that are falling underneath the cracks right now, maybe in the healthcare environment or in a social services environment. Um, so quite the opposite. Rather than reducing the need for them, we would actually see more use of risk and screening, uh, risk screening tools. Yeah, and I would, that, that's very well said. I would absolutely agree. Um, you can think about the current risk assessments as helping you within a case and to an extent, this analysis is helping us look at all of the cases together. Um, so um, two different things in a way, and they, but they are mutually reinforcing. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next couple of slides. Um, we have some contact information for Nicole on this slide. Um, I'll leave that up for just a second. And this is Stephanie. That contact information is, again, if you're interested in learning more about this work and your state and, and, and participating with us in the experiment and these early phases, 
please do reach out to Nicole. Awesome, thank you. And then I'll just show you all this last slide. Uh, this last slide provides the contact information for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. So uh, we are just past the hour mark. I wanna say thank you again so much to our presenters today for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you uh, so much to audience members for attending with us today and being engaged. And um, I hope everybody has a great rest of their day.